Good morning, this is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. From cars to coal, the dramatic collapse of the Baltimore Bridge adds another disruption to global trade. We will bring you the latest as authorities suspend search and rescue operations. The yen slumps to its lowest level against the dollar since 1990, raising the prospect of intervention. Japan's finance minister says he will take direct action if needed. Plus, China's President Xi Jinping meets with American business leaders in Beijing as tensions rise between the world's two largest economies. Let's check in on these markets then. Three straight days of losses for US stocks with the context that you are still set for five straight months of gains across US equities. A fresh record pushed through from U European stocks yesterday. Currently, European futures pointed to losses, modest losses of around a tenth of a percent across the European stocks 50 futures, as you can see. FTSE 100 futures with a focus on softer iron ore prices today. Currently, 7,956. Currently flat, essentially, across the futures coming through for the FTSE 100. S&P futures, though, pointed to gains again after three straight days of losses, up three tenths of a percent. NASDAQ futures looking to add 56 points. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then of course today with the focus on the Japanese yen given what we've been hearing from the finance minister and looking at that 152 level seems to be the line in the sand being articulated by officials over in Tokyo 151.76 currently on the Japanese yen a move there of a tenth of a percent it's the yield differential of course that continues to put pressure on that Japanese currency versus the US dollar and what the Fed is doing with rates talking of the Fed that flows in and ties in, of course, to the story around the auction yesterday. Five-year notes coming through the auction. Uh, the bid to ratio coming in pretty decent. So there is still appetite, a little bit lower bid to ratio than had been in previous sessions. Currently, the 10-year, the benchmark 10-year at 423. Not all the movement currently across the U.S. Treasury curve. The pound in focus, 126 currently, just softer by a tenth of a percent. And Brent crude, $85 a barrel, down a full 1% right now on the back of a report suggesting that inventories have started to build out in the US. Let's cross over to the Asian session then, get a check on the Asian session, how Asian markets are faring this Wednesday with Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. Avril. Yeah, Tom, we are focusing on the Japanese currency after it hit 15197 earlier in the session. Levels we haven't seen since 1990, surpassing 15195, which in October 2020 drew those intervention moves from Japanese officials. And all this triggered by a Japanese BOJ board member who's typically a hawk, sounding dovish and saying that financial conditions will remain accommodative. The finance minister coming through soon after, keeping a lid on things with verbal intervention, but as our MLive colleagues point out, we have large options uh, and there are going to be potentially, if you look at the levels 152 uh, and above, that could mean that dollar yen really jumping. But if we see how the bonds, the real estate stocks are faring today, it seems to be cheering on the accommodation and those comments. Japanese equities are outpacing what we see in the rest of the region. It's not just about the cheap yen, it's also about the month end phenomenon, retail investors coming through. Uh, as we see, this is the last trading day before many companies go ex-dividend. Let's take you to China, where equities there are really underperforming. That's despite data showing that industrial profits rose for the first two months. Signs of stabilization in the Chinese economy. But this week, we have those troubled developers earning scorecards to get through. Wanka, Country Garden. Bloomberg Intelligence points out that weak sales for these developers likely to have extended this month. So CSI 300 Hang Seng down, Hang Seng Tech also getting beaten up. Let's flip the board and take you to the culprit. Once the former crown jewel, I would say, of e-commerce in China, Alibaba, after years of regulatory crackdowns, now more recently struggling to deal with intense competition from younger rivals such as Pintuotuo, now saying it's scrapping its listing plans of its logistics arms just a couple of months after saying the same for its cloud unit. Investors not liking what they're hearing about the strategy and the stock is down today. That's what we're seeing in the Asia-Pacific, Tom. Avril Hong.
excellent run through of what we're seeing across those Asian markets. Thank you very much indeed. Joining us out of Singapore, of course. Let's focus back on the story out of the U.S. right now. Officials, of course, in the U.S. city of Baltimore saying that the active search and rescue operations have been suspended after yesterday's obviously dramatic bridge collapse. Six people are unaccounted for now and presumed dead. The disaster happened when a cargo ship lost power and hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The state governor says a mayday call from the ship allowed authorities to limit vehicle traffic on that bridge and reduce the casualties. I spoke with Governor Moore this morning, as well as the mayor of Baltimore, the county executive, United, to both United States senators and the congressman. And my secretary of transportation is on the scene. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. OK, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's John Herskovitz with the details. John, get us up to speed on where things stand in terms of the recovery operations around this bridge. to the U.S. in a few hours, and then we're going to see uh, more of the recovery, looking for the, uh, the remains of the six people who are presumed dead in these. These were construction workers who were on the bridge. As the piece mentioned, there was a mayday call that went out, which stopped vehicle traffic um, from going over the bridge, but they're trying to find these six people, and then they have this massive wreck of the bridge, of that cargo ship, the container ship with um, shipping containers dangling off of it, this massive section of infrastructure that's in the water now that they're trying to navigate through, find out how to get through all of this. It's just, it's a devastating scene for the, uh, for the city, for the people in the area, and also an incredibly difficult engineering problem to fix, given the damage that was caused and having this massive ship right there. And John, talk to us about the implications in terms of supply chains, in terms of the US economy, but also potentially the global economy as well. Exactly. Baltimore's port is one of the top 20 ports in the US. There's the bigger ones out there, but Baltimore had uh, some specialty items. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, for automobiles in the US. In fact, I think um, near the bridge itself, you'll, there's a BMW and a Volkswagen facility for uh, automobiles. So you have that. It's also um, a key facility for coal. You have uh, steel, gypsum, and the, the, the port is effectively closed. So you're going to see uh, traffic move to other uh, ports in the U.S., which could create bottlenecks. You could see uh, over ports being overwhelmed you could this will have problem this will affect uh, various types of uh, of supply chains but it's we're going to have to find out how it's all going to uh, unfold because it, we're just still a few hours into this and we have to find out where the ships where the shipping is going to go where the sh where the cargo is going to be unloaded or loaded so um, there's going there are going to be effects it's just a matter of finding out what they're going to be and how they hit the ports of the U.S. OK, Bloomberg's John Herskovitz, thank you very much indeed on the latest in terms of the rescue uh, and recovery operation around that bridge and, of course, the potential implications for supply chains of the U.S. and potentially globally as well. Thank you. Now to what is happening in China. Important meeting between the Chinese President Xi Jinping. Meeting with U.S. business executives in Beijing as the nation looks, of course, to shore up confidence amid a slowdown in foreign investment. Global business leaders are also gathering at China's annual Boao Forum, the Asian version of the WEF, or World Economic Forum, in Davos. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, who's been covering this event for many a year, is there. Uh, Steve, talk to us about the importance of this meeting then with Xi Jinping, with the Chinese president, with some of those US CEOs. Some of them had to delay their plans. What does it signal about Chinese intentions? How significant is this meeting? 
Well, the China Development Forum, as you very well know, Tom, in your days in Beijing, is a annual meeting uh, that was kind of put on hold a little bit through the pandemic, obviously, COVID zero. So this is a get to, uh, reacquainted kind of tour of U.S. and other international executives to come to China, not only to the CDF, the China Development Forum, in the Diaoyutai State Guest House in central Beijing uh, and meeting with senior Beijing leaders, but also down here, uh, some 2,700 kilometers to the south on the island of Hainan for the the annual Boao Forum. I haven't been here in five years because of all those constraints that I talked about because of COVID zero. So there's another get reacquainted kind of tour uh, for myself and for these executives. But up at the CDF, uh, we had gotten wind last night that uh, there was be a senior leader. And that obviously means Xi Jinping was going to be meeting the U.S. delegation, not only of business executives, but also from academia. And sure enough, it happened today. Uh, we don't know the precise details of the uh, talk. We do know that at least uh, Blackstone Steve Schwartzman was a participant. We're still trying to get confirmation of others. But we do know that Apple's Tim Cook was there for the CDF. We know that Pfizer's Albert Bourla was there, also the heads of FedEx uh, and also Chubb. A number of other executives were there uh, meeting with Chinese officials. But keep in mind, Tom, uh, usually at the CDF, they meet with the premier. This time, again, Li Chang was sort of sidelined. He didn't have the meeting with them, much like we saw at the National mm. People's Congress. Li Chang did not have his annual press conference. It was Xi Jinping who came in today and met face to face with the U.S. executives. Yeah, that's interesting context, isn't it? You are, of course, on the ground, uh, uh, Steve, and, and you've been conversing, you've been speaking to CEOs and leaders uh, from U.S. companies, other companies as well. What is the sense? Are they, are they convinced that, that China really is making this effort now? How, how much conviction is there amongst business leaders that China is still a place to invest and do business? I think the fact that they made the effort to come here indicates their level of interest. I do think that the companies that we've spoken to today, obviously Fortescue Metals, uh, Andrew Forrest, as well as Pascal Sorio of AstraZeneca, they are investing heavily in China and have been through the pandemic and, w and years before. Uh, AstraZeneca, some $6 billion investing into seven different uh, Chinese uh, bio pharmaceutical companies over the last 12 months. They are in for the long haul, as is, uh, you know, Fortescue Metals. So they are just coming to reestablish those commercial ties that might have had a pause a bit uh, during the pandemic uh, and also kind of reassess uh, the policy direction right now, because there's been, let's face it, opacity in policy and clarification. They want clarification on where the Chinese leadership, while on the one hand they're saying they're going to be tightening their belts this year fiscally, on the other side they're going to be investing heavily in new technologies, new productive forces is what Xi Jinping talks about. But we need more clarity on what that exactly means. Is it going to be bifurcated, new productive forces only for Chinese made chips, only for AI, only for those supply chains within China? Or is there participation available for global participants? There's a lot of questioning and answering going on. Okay, excellent stuff. Stephen Engel, thank you very much indeed. And I hope you make advantage, take advantage of that, of that gleaming swimming pool behind you at some point, at least, uh, over the next 12 hours or so. Steve Engel on the ground for us, covering the Boao Forum, of course, in Hainan, China. Here's what else to look out for today, then. On the earnings front, HMM, so the retail pulse coming through, 7 a.m. UK time. That is going to cross. We'll bring that data to you live as well. To what extent are they able to navigate the supply chain challenges, the input costs, inflation, of course, and how much demand are they seeing from their consumer base? That will be interesting. 7 a.m. UK time. Meanwhile, on the inflation front more broadly, we're going to get Spanish February CPI, 8 a.m. UK time, by the way. The expectation is that you could get a print year-on-year -year CPI of around 3.1%. That's a survey. That comes out Again, 8 a.m. UK time, so give us a bit of a flavour as to how the inflation dynamics are evolving across the Eurozone. Meanwhile, 8.30 a.m. UK time. It's the Rick's Bank decision over in Sweden. The expectation is they will keep rates on hold at 4%, but they could, the Central Bank of Sweden, give a plan and outline as to when the groundwork or when they could cut. So they could lay the groundwork for a cut. They are widely expected to hold rates at 4%. That decision at 8.30 a.m. UK time. And of course, we will bring that to you live. You can, of course, get a roundup as well of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can go to DAYB Go 
and one of the top stories right now is on the Japanese yen. We're looking at 152, potentially, is the line for the Ministry of Finance, for the BOJ. We've had officials coming out today again issuing some very strong rhetoric around potential intervention given the weakening that we've seen in that currency. You're currently looking at it 151.69, just down a tenth of a percent. It's the rate differential, of course, that's putting pressure on the Japanese currency versus BOJ, of course, rates versus the Fed. Even as the VOJ has moved out of negative territory, that gap remains, of course, significant versus the Fed. You're looking at 151.68. Good news, of course, for Japanese stocks. They've rallied again in the session. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the so-called no-fail mission to protect the Red Sea and why those Houthi attacks on ships continue. Plus, we're going to be talking about decarbonizing the textile industry with Dennis Nabilius, the CEO of Sire. It's an H&M joint venture. Stay with us for that. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has told his Israeli counterpart that civilian casualties in Gaza are far too high and humanitarian aid is far too low. Austin made the pointed comment as he welcomed Israel's defense minister to the Pentagon. Tensions between the two sides remain after the U.N. passed a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire with an abstention from the U.S. Staying in the Middle East, the U.S. and its allies have been trying to stop the Iran-backed Houthis, of course, but attacks on commercial and military ships continue. Let's bring in Paul Wallace, then, our Middle East economy and government team leader, for the details on this. Paul, key question, then. Why can't the Houthis be stopped by the firepower of the U.S., the U.K., and the assistance of others? Hi, Tom. That is a good question. I think one of the reasons is that they are using, in, in some ways, uh, limited power to try and stop these maritime attacks uh, by the Houthis and Iran-backed organization that are using missiles and drones against commercial vessels and also warships in, a, in, a, in the southern Red Sea and the, the Gulf of Aden. Um, they are striking, uh, the US and the UK are striking um, Yemeni territory uh, fairly often, every few days um, at the moment to hit Houthi military targets and they are on a daily basis um, hitting Houthi drones and intercepting the, the group's missiles. But they don't want to get too deep into Yemen. They don't want to do anything that causes um, fatalities among Yemeni civilians, for example. So in some ways, they are being quite constrained. The other, uh, one of the big problems they have, though, is that the Houthis had a large arsenal before they started these maritime assaults in mid mid-November, and they are almost certainly being resupplied on a fairly regular basis by Iran. And it's extremely difficult to stop those resupplies, uh, which are coming via ships, um, sometimes very small ships. We're talking about DAOs. Um, and the US and the UK and others just have no effective means uh, to totally um, stop those resupplies by uh, intercepting uh, those ships. It's extremely complicated. OK, Paul Wallace, thank you very much indeed on the challenges, of course, of dealing with that Houthi threat to the shipping lane around the Red Sea and why it has proven uh, arguably a little bit more complex and challenging than maybe some, some had assumed. Bloomberg's Middle East government and economy editor Paul Wallace, of course, with the consequences for global shipping. We appreciate it. Coming up, Nigeria hikes interest rates for the second time in just a matter of weeks, but will it help the country's battered currency? We get the details on the latest next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Happy Wednesday. Now, the chair of the ANC has told Bloomberg that South Africa's ruling party needs to consolidate its support as it heads into a crucial election. In an exclusive interview, he spoke about the prospect of a coalition government. In South Africa, society is not ready for coalition. They don't work in local government where they've started. Everywhere it collapsed. I'm staying in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. There's a coalition there led by the DA for eight years. 
I have no water there for two days now. Mm -hmm. Two days. I don't have water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I blame half the A because it is leading, but it shows the functionality of coalitions. OK, we'll have more from that interview in our next episode of Bloomberg Africa Amplified as part of our build-up to South Africa's elections. That is Africa Amplified next Friday, April the 5th at 5.30 a.m. UK time. Now, staying in the region, Nigeria's central bank has raised interest rates for the second time in just a matter of weeks. The bank is stepping up its battle to curb inflation and sustain a recovery in the nation's battered currency with inflation at around 30%. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondura Ogunga right now for the details. Ondura, get us up to speed then on these decisions, what it means for the currency and why the Central Bank of Nigeria has acted again. The central bank made this decision because they're monitoring global conditions and they think that um, developed economies are likely to keep their monetary policies tight before they begin um, loosening them towards the end of the year. And that means that policies will remain tight for a better part of 2024, with interest remaining high before they begin declining. And zooming in on Nigeria, um, inflation is on the rise, 31.7% in February, up from 29.1% in January. Food inflation is also on the rise, 37%. And it's the same issues driving inflation, Tom, high cost of energy, insecurity in food producing regions, but also the currency, as you had mentioned, and this is a currency that has had a really tough time since Tinibu took over. They've introduced a raft of measures to try and introduce stability, but the Naira is still weak now than it was 12 months ago. And so Africa um, economics say that uh, we are likely to see two more tightening cycles of 100 basis points in May and July before they close that cycle. OK, more hiking cycles or at least more hikes likely to come then from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Meanwhile, Indiro, on South Africa, we know, of course, it's a big election year. We've been hearing from one of the key officials on the ANC. But on central bank and monetary policy of South Africa, the decision later today, what are you, what are the team looking out for? We're looking out to see what decision they're going to make. The central bank governor has made it very clear that the policy will remain tight until inflation begins declining towards their midpoint. That is when they will only loosen it. And their midpoint is 4.5%. And despite data coming out showing that inflation will begin declining in 2025 and 2026, the governor maintains that until the decline is towards that midpoint range of 4.5, policies will remain tight. OK, Bloomberg's Ondira Agunga leading us up to that decision from the Central Bank, of course, of South Africa on the ground for us in Joburg. Thank you very much indeed. Now to a story that Ondira covered for us at the start of the week, and that story has continued to evolve. Cocoa Futures briefly hitting a record $10,000, $10,000 per metric tonne earlier as the market continues to deal with supply shortages. Prices have more than doubled this year, with the sector rattled by poor crops in key West African countries that has put the world on course for a third straight annual supply deficit. Coming up, H&M's plan to recycle millions of tonnes of polyester. We're going to speak to the CEO of its new joint venture to discuss the viability of what they call textile recycling at hyper scale. Is it really going to move the needle in terms of the retail sector's carbon footprint? That is next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. From cars to coal, the Baltimore Bridge collapse 
adds another disruption to global trade. We bring you the latest as authorities suspend search and rescue operations. The yen slumps to its lowest level against the dollar since 1990, raising the prospect of intervention. Japan's finance minister says he will take direct action if needed. Plus, China's President Xi Jinping meets with American business leaders in Beijing as tensions rise between the world's two largest economies. Let's check in on these markets then. Three straight days of losses across U.S. stocks, but futures pointing up when it comes to the Nasdaq and S&P E-minis. S&P E-minis pointing high by three-tenths of a percent. Nasdaq futures pointing high by three-tenths. U.S. stocks still on track to post five straight months of gains. When it comes to European stocks, fresh rally, a fresh high, a fresh record yesterday. Today, though, pointing to modest losses given the gains that we saw yesterday down about a tenth of a percent as things stand. FTSE 100 futures currently flat, 7,958. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. We've been talking about the end. It really is the asset of the moment, arguably, given what we've been hearing from the finance minister. Are they going to step in at what level? Is it 152? Currently, you're looking at 151.70, just softer by a tenth of a percent versus the US dollar on the Japanese currency. We continue to watch that story for you. The US 10 year at 422. There was an auction of five year notes, $67 billion worth yesterday. That auction was relatively, relatively uh, well received. Currently the benchmark at 422. The pound, 126, just softer by a tenth of a percent. And break taking a bit of a move lower, currently at $85 a barrel, down nine tenths of a percent on a report that inventories are building out in the US. Let's stay on the US and the story around the Baltimore Bridge. The collapse, of course, and take a closer look at the impact on trade and already stretched supply chains. The consequences are are expected to stretch out for weeks and will hit industries ranging from coal to cars and car makers based here in Europe. Let's get the details then and bring in Bloomberg's Markets Today anchor Kriti Gupta. Kriti, where do we stand in terms of search and rescue? Where do we stand in terms of the economic implications of this? Well, let's start with the human toll first, yeah. of course. The search and rescue operation is now a recovery operation. Six construction workers that were working on potholes on the bridge itself seem to have fallen into the water. The body's still not recovered yet. The Coast Guard presuming them dead just given the weather conditions and, of course, uh, the time that you have spent or expected to have spent in the water as well. That being said, there haven't been any casualties in terms of other civilians or crew members. Remember, traffic was stopped on both sides of the bridge itself before uh, the collision had actually happened. And the crew members as well, I believe 23 crew members from India on board mm. that have now been considered safe and not actually injured despite the fire that had shown up on the ship itself. So that is the uh, human toll as well as talk about the economic toll because the trade is really a big piece of it. I think context is everything yeah. here from the Port of Baltimore. This is the third most uh, kind of busy port on the East Coast. This is really significant in terms of not only car exports, historically its biggest trading partners, Germany, the UK, Japan, uh, working with companies like BMW, Volkswagen, etc. But it's also a big exporter for things like coal and agricultural exports. And that just has to do with pure geography in terms of this port being the closest to some of the Midwestern states. Think Iowa, think Missouri, for example. So it's very easy in terms of export to, to kind of see that port uh, really explode in terms of kind of revenue there. That being said, now all of that rerouted to New York, to the port of uh, Virginia Beach, and of course to the West Coast as well. Yeah, so we watch to see if there's any tension in terms of the other ports that have to take on some of this load. Some trucks, it seems, can pass through a, a, a tunnel, but some can't because of yeah. the, whatever, they're, whatever they're carrying. Um, it's another wrinkle in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. supply chain. It's another wrinkle in the, in the global supply chain. Do we have any understanding of how quickly and uh, they, they can get this bridge repaired? Is this, is this a months-long, years-long project? Where's the funding coming from? Where do we stand on that? So this is a weeks to months long process mm. is what is being told right now. Remember the Biden administration has come out, President Biden himself, saying this is something that the federal government is going to be funding. It's also coming in the context of a political election, of course, in the United States where President Biden is going big on infrastructure and domestic spending. So this is a place where he has lobbied before, especially to the union workers around that area. It's also worth mentioning in particular that when we're talking about the reconstruction efforts here, uh, this is significant in terms of that tunnel that you were mentioning also because the U.S. Naval Academy is actually very close to that area as well. So the mm. kind of rerouting that you're seeing in terms of dealing with excess shipping capacity is crucial because you're dealing with Red Sea tensions, you're dealing with a drought in the Panama Canal, uh, but all of that can only go so far when suddenly you have these other crinkles in the global supply chain. Okay, Chrissy Gupta, thank you very much indeed, of course, for the importance of this story uh, for Baltimore, the city, of course, the impact there, significant, the U.S. economy, and arguably as well, global supply chains with the context there. Chrissy Gupta, anchor, of course, of markets today. Thank you. Let's get to what's happening in the fashion space then and what is happening around attempts 
to reduce the carbon footprint. So we're switching focus here. Fast fashion retailer H&M reporting earnings in the next half hour. They're going to drop at 7 a.m. UK time. Early this month, H&M announced a joint venture to tackle the carbon emitted by the industry's use of polyester. The venture, called Sire, plans to have 12 plants worldwide producing more than 3 million tonnes of so-called circular polyester. I'm joined now, very pleased to say, by Dennis Nobilius, the CEO of Sire. Dennis, thank you for joining us. What is circular polyester? How significant is this joint venture? What is it going to mean for the carbon footprint of H&M? Talk to us about circular polyester, what it means. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, first of all, we are Syre, a textile impact uh, company focused on decarbonizing and de-wasting the textile industry. And I think what's really significant here is that we launched this on a massive scale, backed by H&M Group, uh, Vargas team that you know behind North Vault and How to Green Steel, and also TPG Rice mm-hmm. Climate. So I think what really sets us apart here is that we launched this as an, on a massive scale, as you mentioned before, 12 giga, giga plants, circular polyester, which is actually the jersey that I have here. Uh, that is based upon the technology from North Carolina that we acquired. Uh, and that is really what sets us apart. Global 12 giga plants across all regions with the aim to really make uh, textile waste a circular regional business. Obviously, as you say, H&M, a major backer of this. What is your expectation in terms of what it does for their recycled and circular polyester? To what extent is it going to change the makeup for H&M? A good point. So they were actually starting, they were behind this idea and they see that they have made many investments in smaller companies and then they saw they, they are lacking a global partner at scale that really can deliver volume and make a difference to their uh, footprint or CO2 footprint over the years. So they actually also committed to a take or pay agreement worth $600 million, which means that more than half mm-hmm. of all the forecasted polyester volume at the HMM for the next seven years. That is the kind of commitment that they are putting behind here. How do you scale this? How easy is is it to scale this technology, Dennis? And can you move beyond polyester? Mm. Yeah, that's good. No, we're actually seeing ourselves to be a textile powerhouse. So we start with polyester, but we could easily add on different fibres, different technology along the way. Um, And how easy it is to scale? That's why we have been brought in. So we are a team of scale makers that has been uh, working with this since quite some time. So we moved from the lab Mm. with a couple of professors, which is really great, Matt and Chris, Move that to a 1,000 metric ton plant in, uh, in North Carolina. Now everything is ordered for a 10K metric ton plant, same in North Carolina. We call that the blueprint plant, and you're right, it's all about scaling. We'll then develop the, the processes, the, uh, the tools, and then we'll just you know, match that towards the 12 commercial plants across the globe. So that's how we'll go about and do that in modules okay. and, uh, and it- based out from the US. And, and you, you have this purchase agreement, of course, really significant from H&M, 600 million uh, US dollars in terms of the purchase agreement. Does, does it limit you, though, in terms of other retail partners that you can be aligning with, cooperating with? Does it, does it constrain uh, your, your other customer base? Yeah, that's a good question. And of course, we get that as a start. But this is a clear commitment from H&M. They see this as an industry movement, not something exclusive for them, even though that they may be very happy that they secure the capacity because this will be a scarcity over time. But they are clearly mm-hmm. into that this will not be uh, an exclusive H&M. It's open for, for collaboration. And that's the way that we are set apart now. OK, it's open for collaboration. So you can, you can look to their competitors then in terms of customers. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because we, we should, as an industry, yeah. to make this, uh, this great shift happen. Then we need to co- cooperate on the supply chain and the back end. And then, you know, compete on the front end. That's, that's the way to, to do it. If you really are in for a massive change. What do you say to the sceptics who say recycling polyester with all its microfibers and all the challenges around that, that that is not the right way to approach this? What, what is your pushback to that? That, that, that is a concern from some in yeah. academics and others who look at the climate crisis, who look at the challenges around microfibers and say this is not the right approach. I certainly am. I can, I can, we're happy to engage in that debate. What we see is right now 60 million metric tons every year of polyester, growing up to 90 million metric tons in just a few years. So it's a popular fiber, it's continued to grow, and today it's made from crude oil. That needs to stop, mm. and that's what we can provide. And then, as you also mentioned before, we are becoming a textile powerhouse, so we'll take on the next one, but we need to stop this, this flow. 
OK. And to those who are concerned about greenwashing, and that's a criticism that H&M has faced in the past as well, and arguably this is an attempt to push back on that, when people suggest that maybe this is another layer, another move at greenwashing, this isn't really substantial, how do you take on that, that criticism? Yeah. yeah, good. I think I've seen a number of capsule collections in the past uh, showcasing uh, new technology, which is great. But I think the best way to respond to that is that if you commit more than half of your forecasted volume, then you're committed and it's not greenwashing. That, I would say, that's the response. OK, and you're still, you're still on track with your North Carolina plant. That's going to open this year. Is that still on track? That is correct. So by, uh, by end of summer, you will be able to come and, and check out our depolymerization technology. And then end of the year, you will see mm -hmm. it end of line uh, or end to end. So okay. that's definitely on track. And we had actually been working. Okay. We were launched just, just a few weeks back, but we have been working in two years with this, uh, with this mission. Okay, it's a longer term project. Dennis Nobelius with the context there, CEO at SIA on that partnership, of course, with H&M and the prospects around circular polyester and how that could ultimately change the retail space. We appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, I'm going to speak to the Tim uh, Bevan, the CEO of ETC Group, getting his view on the outlook for crypto and whether or not the London Stock Exchange is any closer to approving ETFs around crypto, spot Bitcoin. That interview is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Bitcoin has breached the $70,000 level again after a 7% surge on Monday. It came after U.S. spot ETFs saw outflows of almost $900 million last week. Of course, the inflows since the SEC approval in January have been significant. I'm joined now by Tim Bevan, the CEO of ETC Group, a major player within the crypto space in terms of the funds that are offered across Europe. Tim, thank you very much for joining us here in the studio. Let's talk about, let's just cast our eye back to January 11th, the SEC approvals of these ETFs. What has it done to your industry? What has it done to demand for the kind of products that you list? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a widely anticipated event um, that, mm -hmm. that took quite a, a long time to come to fruition. Uh, with a lot of lobbying from major asset managers in the US with the SEC. So a uh, very exciting event, I mean, almost slightly hysterical when, uh, when it eventually came, came about. Um, but the, the impact has been... I mean, far larger than, than the wildly, most widely optimistic forecasts. I think we're now at sort of net $11 billion inflows in a couple of months. Uh, and we've seen that expressed in the price action. Um, you know, is, it, is it good news for you? Do you see money moving out of some of your products into those US ETFs? Or are yeah. you seeing overall, overall demand and interest in, in, in the, the crypto space being, being elevated as a result of this? Yes, I mean, the European products have been around longer. Yeah. So I think there was some level of repatriation of US money to, to US products when they were launched. Um, but, but the net impact has been to grow the pie, right? Mm. I mean, this, this is really a legitimization of Bitcoin as an asset class. Um, it's all very well me promoting Bitcoin, but when Larry Fink starts promoting Bitcoin and putting BlackRock behind it, this is, this is a material change uh, and... and impacts people's attitude to Bitcoin globally. Where is Europe in terms... Is Europe playing catch-up when it, when it comes to some of these products, when it comes to the regulatory front, when it comes to building out a crypto industry, a crypto sector? Is it playing catch-up with the US? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, interestingly, uh, Europe has had um, crypto exchange-traded products now for many years, uh, and the range of products available in Europe is quite broad, not just Bitcoin or Ethereum. The number of single-asset crypto um, products are out there. We've got index products. We've got staking return products. So, so there's a breadth of a product available in Europe that's, that's unavailable anywhere else in the world. Um, but, you know, you can't argue with the sheer, shy, uh, sheer size and depth of U.S. capital markets. Mm. Uh, so, so that's a big event. Uh, and I think, you know, the ripples are being felt globally and we expect other jurisdictions... Uh, to accelerate plans that were otherwise moving quite slowly. When you, when you talk of other jurisdictions, does the UK fall into that camp along the stock exchange? They're making moves around exchange-traded notes. Do, do you see the right kind of movement, from your perspective at least, in terms of allowing and regulating ar around this space here in the UK? Yes. Well, I mean, I know the London Stock Exchange has been waiting for quite some time now for the, for the FCA to issue that no-action letter, which came about uh, a couple of weeks ago. What are uh, the consequences of that? Uh, well, we're hearing now that a segment will be launched uh, as early as the end of May uh, on the LSE, uh, which is a really positive step for the UK. 
the disappointment is obviously the, the preclusion of retail. So it's going to be a professional-only market, mm. um, which is hard to understand and, and rationalise given the myriad of ways retail uh, consumers in the UK can access crypto already. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it's difficult to see where the liquidity is going to come from, to be honest. Um, and we expect the professional market will probably stay focused on the more developed markets in Europe. When it comes to those ET, to the ETF sense, so it's, it, it, I'm getting the sense from you, you don't think we're close to getting ETFs, Bitcoin and crypto ETFs approved in Europe or indeed in, in, in the UK. Are, are we any closer to that? Is there a time frame you're looking at? Have you been speaking to regulators? No, I, the, the, the big debate is ETF, ETN, ETP. What, yeah. you know, what are we talking about here? Um, in Europe, an ETF is largely understood to be a USITS fund. And uh, crypto is, is non-eligible for USITS. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Mm. Uh, and the ETN structure that is utilised for crypto is nothing new. This was a solution created some 13 years ago when gold bullion products first came to the European market. So this concept of a fully asset-backed bond... Uh, is an old structure uh, and widely accepted in Europe now for, for gold bullion and other uh, precious metal products. And really, crypto has adopted that structure um, because you take gold out of a vault and you put mm -hmm. Bitcoin on a cold server and the structure works. So it's an old solution in the European market, but these are not funds. The UK regulators previously, in the past, the FCA, have talked about the risks, the fact that crypto is has got links or has been used in financial crime. They talk about the volatility. They talk about some of the fundamentals. They talk about risks, essentially, that retailers and retail investors could be exposed to, and that's been part of their reticence. Is that, is that, is that starting to change? And, and what, what is the flip side to that? What are the risks of retail investors being funneled towards some of those less regulated exchanges if they don't get access to the kind of products that we get in the US now? Well, I think that's precisely the point. I mean, UK retail is a very active participant in the crypto market already, um, you know, arguably, uh, an exchange-traded product is <clears throat> the most highly regulated, lowest, lowest risk form of access uh, that you can get. So, it, again, it seems slightly odd to preclude that one channel uh, as a means by which retail can invest in this market mm. uh, and effectively push them uh, to sort of less regulated or, 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 or schemes with less oversight than potentially uh, a listed security on a regulated market. I can't let you go without asking you about the price. Around 70,000 right now on Bitcoin, up about 150% 150, 150 in, the last, in the last 12 months. Uh, not as good as Coco or NVIDIA, but nonetheless, 150% gain in the last 12 months. Is, is the price looking a little frothy to you? Well, I mean, it's unprecedented. We've never seen uh, Bitcoin hit an all-time high ahead of a halving event in previous cycles. And I, I think the, the biggest explanation for that is the demand side shock that is, is the US ETFs. Uh, and the US, US ETF story is really just beginning. You know, the wirehouses and a number of advisors haven't even onboarded these products yet. So the real distribution story of the US is yet to kick in. Um, but up at 7072 at this stage, picking, picking the price in the short term is tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people should expect elevated uh, volatility, I think, for quite some time. Uh, and, you know, 30 percent retracements in Bitcoin bull markets have been a feature of previous cycles. So, so choosing that entry point is tough. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, looking at the fundamental um, imbalance between supply and demand, I only see that getting worse. So okay. choosing that entry level may be tough, uh, but not having a position, I think, is the bigger risk. And when you talk about halving, of course, you're talking about the capping, essentially, uh, mid-April, I believe, it's, is when it comes through, essentially capping the number of Bitcoins in, in, in distribution, around 21 million, and that, that essentially puts something of a cap on supply. Well, no, the, 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 the cap's hard-coded into the protocol. The halving event, which uh, you're quite right, we expect around the 20th of yep. April... Uh, means that for every, every amount of effort that a miner's expend today, yep. they will get half the amount of Bitcoin going okay. forward. So it's a supply side issue. Okay, Tim, we have to leave it there. Really fascinating. Thanks so much for coming into the studio, walking us through some of the implications of some of the changes around the crypto industry. Tim Bevan, the CEO of ETC Group. Now to some other stories making the news today. Apollo will buy $8 billion in senior secured financing facilities from UBS. The two sides agreed to a change in terms for the deal which, which, with which uh, Credit Suisse originally struck in an unsuccessful last-ditch effort to win back investor confidence before it's rescued by UBS. The business, known as Securitized Products Group, or SPG, bought and sold securities backed by pools of mortgages and other assets such as car loans and credit card debt. Unicredit is close to locking in more favourable terms in its dealings with payments processor Nexi. The revised agreement would strengthen an accord the Italian bank reached in 2021 with S. 
IA, which was later absorbed into Nexi. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. I don't see China as a threat. I advise everyone to not see China as a threat. And I certainly say to everyone in China, don't ever be a threat. In the last number of years, we have brought our medicines to China to help patients. But in the last four or five years, innovation has boomed in China and uh, it has given many opportunities for us, but also other global pharma companies to partner with Chinese biotech companies. The relationship has gone through a bad period and we're still, I think, just coming out of that valley since uh, San Francisco summit meeting between uh, President Biden and uh, Chairman Xi, we've confirmed that we're going to start talking in a number of different areas, commercial, cultural, military, all very important. We haven't really seen those dialogues get up and running in a strong way, but I'm optimistic we will. Okay, Bloomberg guests there speaking to Stephen Engel from the Boao Forum in Hainan in China on the Chinese economy, doing business in that economy. Talking of which, you wouldn't notice by looking at the Chinese markets today, but the macro data has started to improve, at least when you look at industrial profits. For the last two months, industrial profits picking up in China, up 10% most recent data point that came through earlier this morning, building on the upside that you saw in terms of the profitability towards the end of last year. Yes, the base effects are flattering this number to some extent when you cast your eye back uh, year on year. But nonetheless, it does, according to our team at Bloomberg Economics, suggest that there is at least stabilisation coming through for some parts of the Chinese economy. Yes, deflation remains a problem. The real estate sector, of course, remains a huge challenge. But on some levels, things are starting to at least stabilise. Economists, again, that we speak to suggest more does need to be done to support domestic consumers. Let's flip the board and have a look at the cocoa price story, because this continues to be remarkable. Here's the comparison. Topping the price of copper for the first time in two decades, above $10,000 a metric tonne. It's come off that a little bit, closed about a uh, little over 9000 but it did cross through that 10000 level. Yes, there's the issue around the crops in West Africa and potentially a further challenge with EU restrictions on summer cocoa. But again, the pushing up the prices, $10,000, and in terms of the performance and the upside in terms of prices, you've beaten chips, NVIDIA, for example, over the last 12 months. That is just something to bear in mind as we look at the soft commodity story. Markets Today is coming up next. Plenty more on these markets. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 